signed some papers, and I had become a full-fledged, I call it cooperating witnesses, but everybody in the country calls it stool pigeon. <laughs> Sam Gravano was John Gotti's designated heir apparent, his best buddy in crime. He has, since his cooperation, given us over a dozen felony convictions against a dozen different people. But I'm telling you what I'm exposing to you and the press and everybody, this is my doom. It is a pact with the devil, there's no doubt about that, but it is one that on balance is in society's best interest. December 11th, 1990. For the fourth time in five years, reputed mob boss John Gotti was under arrest. Wearing his handcuffs as cavalierly as he wore his thousand dollar suits, Gotti, known as the Dapper Don by the press, was led off to jail. Arrested with him were three colleagues in Gotti's alleged mafia organization, the Gambino crime family, including Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano, Gotti's right hand man. The Gambinos were the largest and most powerful of New York's five crime families. They controlled the New York Garment District, had a hold on the waterfront through the Longshoremen's Union, and took huge kickbacks from the garbage and trucking industries. Prosecutors said Gotti had seized control of the family in a palace coup. They now charged him with engineering the murder of Paul Big Pauly Castellano, the previous Gambino chief. Big Pauly had died in classic mafia fashion gunned down on a sidewalk in 1985 as he climbed out of his Lincoln to dine at his favorite Manhattan restaurant. It was Gotti, prosecutor said, who had sent out his gunman to do the job after getting the other New York families to approve the killing. If the charges were true, Gotti's betrayal of his boss was vicious and cold, but part of mob tradition. Aging mafia overlords had often been slain by impatient, ambitious underlings. But now Gotti found that he himself had been betrayed in a matter not sanctioned by Mafia practice. Sammy the Bull Gravano had decided to rat on his boss. Faced with the possibility of life in prison, Gravano chose instead to deliver his mentor and godfather to the feds in exchange for a lighter sentence. After the trial, Gravano would be entered in the government's witness protection program, given a new identity and protected by federal marshals. For the prosecutors, it was a fair trade. No other figure associated with the mob drew attention like John Gotti. Despite his impeccable grooming, his fashion plate wardrobe, and his Mercedes Benz, he had for years filed his income tax returns as a plumbing salesman. He had served a total of eight years in prison, two of them for a barroom killing in 1968. He still lived in this modest home in Queens. With Gotti life imitated art, the press had at last found a mob leader who fit the image set by Hollywood and the huge success of the Godfather films. Reporters tripped over one another to capture him on videotape. As the saying goes, the camera loved Gotti. And Gotti loved the camera, especially when it recorded him walking out of a courtroom a free man. This he had done three times to the frustration of government lawyers. As the defendant John Gotti, do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty of the first count of the indictment, charging him with the crime of conspiracy in the fourth degree. We find him not guilty. With each acquittal, Gotti got a little more famous and became a little more of a legend for winning his bouts with American justice. Thank you. Much of Gotti's success in the federal courts could be credited to his unflagging champion, the colorful defense attorney, Bruce Cutler. It's not right what you're doing, singling people out and going after them, harassing them, using witnesses who lie, who say anything for money and a, and a new identity. And I think people have just said it, enough. Cutler helped Gotti earn a new nickname, the Teflon Don, because no charge could be made to stick. Once an unknown, Gotti became one of New York's best known citizens. Camera crews even attended the July 4th picnics he threw for his whole Brooklyn neighborhood. Police had long since stopped bothering to enforce the New York law against private fireworks. But if any person could make the new charges stick to Gotti, it was Grafano. As Gotti's confidant and right-hand man, Gravano was privy to Gotti's secrets. And he was icing on the cake for the U.S. attorneys. 
who had spent the years since their last failure gathering hundreds of hours of audio recordings of Gotti's meetings and private conversations. Gravano was part of many of those discussions, including one where Gotti offered him the promotion of his choice. You want me to make you official underboss, active boss? How do you feel? What makes you feel better? These conversations made Gravano the ideal stool pigeon. The very evidence against Gotti would shore up the credibility of the principal witness. As the trial approached, Gotti was deprived of another key ally, longtime defender Bruce Cutler. At a pretrial hearing, prosecutors played tapes in which Gotti described Cutler handling illegal deals. You know and I know that they know that he's taking the money to the table. Every time you take a client on the law, you break the law. The U.S. attorneys insisted the tapes compromise Cutler's credibility in the courtroom. The judge agreed and barred Cutler from representing his most famous client. Little by little, the surveillance evidence against Gotti was whittling away his usual defenses. Cutler was furious. I am just personally offended and angry, and I, and I still cannot fathom that I will not be addressing this jury in this case. In place of Cutler, Gotti hired renowned defense attorney Albert Krieger. And as he waited for trial, Gotti was said to be running the Gambino family from his jail cell. But this time, the deck seemed to be stacked against the man America had come to know as the Teflon Don. Even his 4th of July picnic went afoul when the annual fireworks display exploded all at once. It was as if Gotti's whole world was blowing up in his face. Sammy the Bull Gravano was expected not only to tattle on his boss, but to act as a kind of mafia translator. Mobsters know the government will listen in on them, so they talk in a loose code, issuing orders for murder or massive drug shipments in language that could seem meaningless to a jury. The mob rat interprets the mafia jargon and maps out the bloody chain of command. This Gravano did, but like all mafia informers, Sammy the Bull was also a liability for the prosecutors. On the stand, he would implicate Gotti in 10 murders and admit to 19 himself. So the trick for the prosecution would be to prove that John Gotti was a killer on the word of a professional hitman. Modern mob prosecutions rely on a kind of one-two punch. The first blow comes from surveillance. The second is the stool pigeon. After almost a year in jail waiting for trial, New York Mafia underboss Sammy Gravano decided in November 1991 to turn on his boss, John Gotti, and testify for the prosecution. As part of the prosecution team, Patrick Cotter prepared Gravano for trial. He says Gravano had heard the most damaging pieces of the government surveillance tapes, and he believes Sammy turned or flipped, as the FBI calls it, because he saw he was going to be Gotti's fall guy. What was John Gotti's defense at trial to all the murders? I didn't kill those people. Sammy did. Sammy smelled that coming. At a secret midnight rendezvous with prosecutors, he struck a deal. In exchange for his complete cooperation, Gravano was guaranteed a maximum sentence of 20 years in jail. There is no rational basis for the deal given to Gravano except that the government was hag-ridden and manically driven to obtain a conviction against Mr. Gotti. I realize that's a damning statement in certain respects, but I stand by it. Al leaves out the fact that we didn't go to Sammy, Sammy came to us. Nobody went and cut some wonderful deal with Sammy Gravano. He was given a deal to give up everybody. This man was the head of a family with dozens and dozens and dozens of high-ranking, powerful members, who all of whom deserved to be in jail for crimes ranging from murder to extortion to corruption. Now under protection of federal marshals, Gravano fired his lawyer. Gotti defense attorney Albert Krieger got word and rushed to tell Gotti the bad news. Mr. Gotti said, and I can quote him, he said, oh my, and in just about that tone, all the innocent people that that man is going to hurt. By the time the trial began in Brooklyn in January 1992, it was the hottest show in town. 
Judge I. Leo Glasser sequestered the jury to protect them from media exposure. He also ordered that they be kept anonymous to prevent tampering. The jurors went in and out of the courthouse behind the tinted windows of limousines. The deal with Gravano would be a waste if the jury was shocked by the stool pigeon's own crimes. In his opening statement, lead prosecutor Andrew Maloney had to tell the jury of Gravano's chilling mob resume, including involvement in 19 murders. The first that I heard that he was a mass murderer was in Mr. Maloney's opening statement. So even though I knew that he was going to be a witness against Mr. Gotti, I had no idea of the scope of the testimony or, in truth, the nature of the beast. Gotti and his co-defendant, Associate Frank Lacasio, were charged with racketeering, meaning a string of crimes that add up to a pattern of criminal behavior. Gotti himself was separately charged with 11 other crimes, which included ordering the murders of three low-ranking mafia gunmen. But the centerpiece of the case was the murder charge against Gotti for arranging the execution of his boss, Gambino godfather, Big Pauli Castellano. And when at last Gravano was brought in under the tightest security, that was the story with which he began his testimony. In his gravelly voice, Sammy the Bull told the court how he helped Gotti plan the murder. Paul Castellano, as head of the Gambinos, was the most important mafia boss in America. But by 1985, his grip on his family was slipping. His home had been bugged. He was under indictment on multiple charges. It was known in the underworld that Big Pauly had issued orders that any Gambino member involved in big drug deals would be killed. John Gotti had just been implicated in such a deal by the feds. Gravano told the court that in December 1985, Gotti decided to save his skin by killing Castellano, or in mob parlance, whacking him. Gotti arranged for Castellano to be called to dinner at his favorite restaurant on Manhattan's east side. Castellano uh, felt he was the boss of the bosses. He wasn't worried too much. He just had the one bodyguard with him. They walked up, four guys came, they killed him. Uh, wasn't complicated. They walked away, they disappeared in the crowd. Gravano came across in the courtroom as calm and dignified, wearing a double-breasted suit, often putting on a pair of bifocals to look at evidence. It gave this confessed murderer the air of a studious businessman. Even Albert Krieger, famous for his penetrating cross-examination, couldn't break down Gotti's former number two. He was contained, articulate, not responsive as the angry, blustering, uh, in some respects, degenerate I now know him to be. Prosecutors know that when they put a criminal informer on the stand, they have to make all his crimes known. If he is caught in any deception, all his testimony is compromised, and the witness is rendered useless. This was especially true of Sammy the Bull. Gravano is a self-confessed, admitted, vicious, cold-blooded, serial killer. I thought he did great. I think everybody who was there thought he did great in the sense of they believed him. They didn't like him. They didn't like him at all. He's not a likable guy in a lot of ways. <laughs> well, in all ways, frankly. Albert Krieger made sure the jury knew what kind of person Gravano was. He pointed out that Gravano's 19 murder victims outnumbered the 18 jurors and alternates. We don't have enough chairs to put all the victims in, Krieger said. The problem for the defense was that every time you show the jury what a truly bad person Sam was, you were in fact telling them John Gotti's best friend, heir apparent, best buddy and the man he loves is a bad, bad man. You couldn't disassociate the two. My mother always said, you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. Uh, I think that's a very nice and soft way of saying that which we have all experienced. We are judged in many respects by our friends and by our associates. As poised as he was, Gravano's record clearly painted him as a monster. The feds were arguing that Gotti was simply the chief monster. Cotter says the prosecution made no excuses to the jury about the character of their star witness. You don't trust a Sammy Gravano. You don't trust an informer. I don't, anyway. I don't know any responsible prosecutor who does. 
you trust them when you know they're telling the truth because you've proven it through unimpeachable sources. At the Gotti trial, those sources were the eavesdropping tapes made by the FBI. Not only had the feds bugged Gotti's principal hangout, the Ravenite Social Club, the agents had even managed to sneak a microphone into the apartment above the club where the suspicious Gotti held his most private and incriminating conversations. You tell this punk, I meet John Gotti and I your mother head I kept wondering what possible response the defense would have to that. How do you explain that your client has just said, when I whacked DB? How, how do you explain when he says, you know, when I killed, uh, you know, uh, you know why Louis de Bono is going to die? He's going to die because he didn't come in when I called him. Um, how do you explain that? I think that the sever the head remark was neutralized by its exposure for what it was, an overstatement. A, uh, an extreme expression. We're not all that restrained in our everyday language, and this was everyday language for Mr. Gotti. Gotti's language did not seem so everyday in other cases. On one tape, he said to his co-defendant, Frank Locasio, every time we got a partner that don't agree with us, we kill him. The trial lasted two and a half months. The government's one-two punch of Gravano and the tapes had been a powerful combination. But in his closing statement, lead prosecutor Andrew Maloney nearly compromised his entire case. He warned the jury that if they were afraid of John Gotti, they had good reason. It was a highly prejudicial comment. The defense attorneys immediately called for a mistrial, claiming Maloney had poisoned the jury. I thought I'd fall off the chair. I could not believe what I had heard. I have known Mr. Maloney too long and too well to believe that that remark was anything else other than a deliberate remark. Think about it for a second. What possible motive could the lead prosecutor have in saying to the jury that we're just, we've just spent an hour, no, actually we've spent a day asking them, please find this defendant guilty? What possible motive would we have for saying to him, oh, and by the way, if you do, he'll kill you? Judge Glasser did not rule for a mistrial, and the jury found John Gotti guilty of racketeering and all the other counts, including the three murders. He was sentenced to life without parole. Frank Lacasio was convicted on all counts except a minor gambling charge. After the sentencing, a crowd from Gotti's neighborhood erupted into a riot outside the courthouse, overturning U.S. Marshals' cars and attacking policemen. Gotti's fans were confident. And I'll bet anybody in this world, whatever they want to bet, that this man would see a bit. Today, John Gotti is doing his time at Marion Federal Prison in southern Illinois. He's currently appealing his conviction to the U.S. Supreme Court. Sammy the Bull Gravano, on the other hand, has visited Washington, where he testified before Congress on the Mafia's infiltration of professional boxing. In 1994, as a reward for testimony that prosecutors said led to almost 40 convictions, Gravano received his own sentence, five years. So if everything works out perfect, he's got every thug in America out to kill him, and when he's 65, he can get out and try and keep out of their way until he dies. Along the way, he loses his family, his friends, his home. It beats life without parole, I'll admit that, but not by much. My name is Salvatore Gravano. Early in my life, I was given the nickname Sammy the Bull. I have been in jail since December of 1990, when I was arrested with John Gotti. I was his underboss and second of command of the Gambino family. Most mafia informers turn or flip only after they're out of range of the mob's lethal vengeance. But next, we'll hear from a stool pigeon who stayed in the mafia to exact his own revenge. This mob rat worked undercover for the FBI for three years, gathering evidence until he put a dozen fellow mobsters behind bars. The common image of a mafia stool pigeon is that of a man in a hushed courtroom surrounded by a wall of bodyguards. He turns on his former partners in crime from the relative safety of the witness protection program. But some mob rats take much bigger risks. I wore body recorders for evidence. You know, I risked my life getting evidence. I didn't just go there and say, look, this guy did this, this guy did that, this guy did this. Joseph Joe Dogs Iannuzzi 
A Florida mobster from the Gambino family's heyday put a dozen of his mafia pals behind bars for revenge. Born in 1931, Ianuzzi grew up in a New York City suburb. At the age of 14, Joe was already a smooth operator with a police record. He was a chip off the old block of his small-time bookie father. I used to go around with him on a Saturday and pick up the number bets. My father wasn't a good father or anything. You know, he was, uh, you know, a hustler. But uh, my mother raised me good, you know, the best she could. To straighten out, he joined the Army. He saw action in Korea and was wounded twice. But after his discharge, it wasn't long before he was picking up a quick illegal buck where he could working with crooks on the fringe of the mob. By his 30s, Joe found himself living in West Palm Beach, Florida, with a wife and three kids, but no real career. As usual, he was on the outskirts of the underworld. That's when he met Gambino soldier Tommy Agro. When I first met Agro, I thought I met the boss of the mob. He had such charm and class and uh, sharp dresser and jewelry that you know, he was my idol, you know, and uh, I, uh, I wanted to be just like him. Tommy and Joe's relationship was a love-hate relationship. Uh, Tommy uh, was much like a, an abusive father who loved his child. In 1971, Tommy Agro was an up-and-coming mobster in the New York Gambino family. He was respected, meaning he was feared, and he was Ianuzzi's hero. To impress Agro, Joe took him to the dog track, a favorite haunt. After a successful day of betting, Agro gave Ianuzzi his official mob nickname, Joe Dogs. Some kind of handle you had to have. Huh? Me, I was Joe Dogs. Before I was Joe Dogs, I was Joe Diner, you know. Be uh, after Joe Diner, I was Joe Drywall. Yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> for his mafia apprenticeship, Joe Dogs would seek out applicants for mob loans at 5% interest or juice each week. 300% a year. Soon, Joe was what authorities called Mr. Organized Crime in Southern Florida. The New York Gambino family, then under boss Big Pauli Castellano, was establishing its control over the region. Joe Dogs became their mouthpiece and their muscle. It was a role he savored. Forget about it. I felt like King Kong. I mean, you know, nobody could come near me. It's, uh, you felt like Superman. I mean, really. I felt like I lived in a phone booth. <laughs> it's, uh, it was a great feeling, yeah? A great feeling. The mob runs on fear, and the fear inspired by the Gambinos helped Joe do his job. And sometimes all it would take was a, a smack. So once in a while, I'd, I'd have to hurt somebody, you know? I'd have to hurt somebody if they, that person didn't know my reputation, for instance, right? Then I would have to really muscle them, you know. In the company of his mafia master, Tommy Agro, Joe whiled away the hours with some of the best known mafia sociopaths, including Tommy DeSimone, a killer made famous posthumously when Joe Pesci portrayed him in the film Goodfellas. This guy was a real screwball. I mean, he, he kill you while you, you're having dinner together. He was a, he was a killer. He was a, a killer. And, uh, but he was a lot of fun. When Joe and his friends weren't breaking legs or extorting protection money, their principal aim was leisure. They might win thousands of dollars on fixed horse races and spend it all on a few dates with their mistresses. But having fun Florida style and running errands for the mob weren't enough for Joe Dogs. He wanted to make his own profits, so he borrowed $60,000 from Agro. Joe Dogs made interest payments of his own to New York and loaned the money out at a higher juice rate. He had become a real operator. Everybody in Southern Florida knew who Joe Dogs Ianuzzi was, including the FBI. I decided that I would knock on Joe's door. In 1978, FBI agent Larry Doss was investigating organized crime in Southern Florida. That meant getting to know the local mobsters and recruiting prospective informants. To that end, Doss began cultivating a polite relationship with Joe Dogs. When Joe opens the door, he's standing there with a gun in his hand. He's got a 38 caliber blue steel revolver. I said, hi, I'm Larry Doss from the friendly FBI. Doss thought Joe might be a good source for the FBI. The word on the street was that Joe was having problems with his mob connections. 
So Doss kept the pressure on, even when Joe left Florida to hide out in Chicago for a few months. The phone rings, and it's Larry Doss on the phone. And Jesus Christ. <laughs> I said, what the hell you want, you pain in the ass? I said, it's joy. I mean, this guy's a dedicated, a devoted and dedicated agent, all right? I said, what do you want, you pain in the ass? Leave me alone. Joe was different than anybody that I'd ever dealt with. And even though he was a, a career criminal from New York and I was a career FBI agent from Georgia, Joe liked me and I liked him. And he gave me his home number. He said, listen, if you need me, here's my home number. He call me anytime, Joe, if, I, if, you, if you're in trouble. You know, he, he, was, he was a nice guy. Joe needed money. He couldn't make the payments on his own loan because he was having trouble collecting money from his loan shark clients. Joe had a sizable amount of money out with a local contractor on juice. Joe felt sorry for the guy couldn't really bring himself to beat the guy up because he was behind in his payments he had a wife and some kids and joe had known the guy for a long time information on the mob is so important to the fbi that the bureau is willing to pay its informants joe decided to start moonlighting as a rat the money he got from the feds he sent to his new york boss tommy agro in place of the interest he owned but the payments weren't enough and tommy agro was getting fed up in February 1981, Agro went down to Florida with two of his goons and called Joe Dogs to a meeting at a local restaurant. I walk up to embrace him, shake hands and embrace him. How you tip? How you doing? And he's squeezing my hand and I see an object coming towards my skull. And the next thing I knew, I was falling you know, and, and being beat with and kick. When Joe Dogs came to, he was in the hospital receiving last rites from a priest. I uh, laid in the hospital and cried for another five days. I couldn't believe what he had done to me. This guy that I worshipped. I says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get even with this son of a bitch if I gotta die doing it. I'm gonna get even. And that's what I did. I got even good. With a recorder provided by the FBI, Joe Doggs began secretly taping his phone conversations with Agro, who was still calling him. It wasn't long before Agro fell into the trap. During one call, Ianuzzi goaded him into a screaming rage. It was the 25th call Joe had taped, now known as Tape 25. You ain't supposed to be alive. Because I was making an example out of you for any mother that tried it on me again. You understand? So the only reason you're still alive, don't think because we stopped. It was because that woman walked in the door. Today you would have been gone. You weren't supposed to walk away no more. You f***ed me, and that was the worst thing you ever did. So I get the tape the next day, and I play this tape, and it's absolutely the most unbelievable conversation you've ever heard. It's everything that the mob is, Tommy Agro was on this tape. I got guys with me, I'll eat your f***ing eyes out of your head. And they're as loyal as a mother And they got balls the size of cows. I would take them to mom and tell them, come on, load up, we're gonna blow this whole joint. They'll walk in and blast everybody. With no hesitation, no nothing, and don't look for nothing besides it. With the tape 25, we had Tommy locked up, you know, for attempted murder. He admitted to it on the phone, the tape. But uh, that was just the beginning. Ianuzzi's mob bosses in New York still needed him as their Florida connection. Even as he was recovering from the beating they'd given him, they gave him a new assignment, to start an illegal gambling club with mob money. The FBI approved the project, provided Joe had a partner of their choosing. The Bureau picked Chicago agent John Bonino. He is a perfect undercover agent. He's Italian, he's, he's handsome, he's smooth, he's from the big city, he knows the mob in Chicago very well piece of cake you get in right away no it didn't feel that easy to me I spent probably the first six months with Joe being tutored by Joe and listening and observing and duplicating a lot of those same traits in the other people John Benino would pose as John Marino a drug running friend of Joe dogs from Chicago as for Joe dogs he turned out to be a natural at undercover work 
Joe was the best that I've ever seen. Uh, Joe had a clear grasp of what the goal was. There was not one request that was made of Joe by the Bureau that he did not comply with and did it credibly. The FBI called it Operation Home Run. With government and mafia money, the undercover operators started up the Beachside Nightclub in Singer Island, Florida. And every step of the way, the mobsters were photographed, videotaped, and recorded. There was times I was scared, yeah. But uh, we were working with, you know, killers. Uh, you know, we were going in the homes of killers. When I say killers, they're butchers. Fat Andy was a butcher. He chopped you up and put you down to the garbage disposal. Joan taught John, and John picked it up and did it so well that Fat Andy Ruggiano, a made capo in the Gambino family, made a hand-to-hand -hand loan with an undercover FBI agent. One of the owners of the bar uh, in Singer Island told me about a year later that they suspected me as being uh, a police officer, an FBI agent, when Joe first brought me in. And the only reason they were telling me that then, or now, was because they knew it was absolutely untrue. Bonino and Joe Dogs wore tape recorders to almost every meeting. Joe wore his where no mafioso would ever feel it by mistake in his underwear. If there's a leak, you never know if they're going to say to you, take your shirt off, or take your pants off, you know? So you always got that in the back of your mind that, you know, it's very uncomfortable to work with a wire. If they had found it, that was Joe Iannuzzi's last day. He would, he would have died right there because there would have been, there would have been, that would have been the end of him and the end of uh, the case. And John, too, for that matter. But the case didn't end. It just kept on getting bigger. The concentric circles just became wider and wider and wider. We ended up with people that we had no idea we were going to targeted that situation. By the time Joe and John were done, their FBI operations had snared a dozen mobsters. The ripples were felt all the way up the Gambino chain of command. If you go back to all of the things that occurred, especially within the Gambino family and, and what happened with Paul Castellano, Paul Castellano's undoing was as a result of Joe. You can go directly back to that. With information from Joe Dogs, the New York FBI began the pursuit of Big Paulie Castellano that ended in the downfall of the ruling Mafia Commission and ultimately in Castellano's murder at the hands of John Gotti. We really, we put a big crimp in it. Or cramp. <laughs> you know, my operation did. Operation Home Run was shut down at last when the FBI learned there was a leak about Joe Dogs to his Mafia pals. Iannuzzi had been wearing a wire for 18 months. He would go on to testify at mob trials for the next decade. He sent Tommy Agro, his one-time idol and would-be executioner, to prison for 10 years. Agro died of cancer in 1987. I wanted him to suffer in prison. I, I really wanted him to suffer. Because I'm suffering now, see? I, because that wasn't my forte, what I did. But I did it to get even. Today, Joe Dogs lives somewhere in America. The FBI says the Gambino family has an open contract out on him. Joe Dogs is a fair target for any mobster who wants to make a good impression on his bosses. I imagine someday someone's going to run across me and pop me. But uh, until then, I'm you know, as careful as I can be. Mob rat Sammy Gravano was big news when he helped put away John Gotti in 1992. But the feds have been using informers to lock up mobsters for more than half a century. One of the earliest stool pigeons helped convict Al Capone in 1930. The rat was Capone's accountant. Capone's uh, liquor business had to have the books kept. Uh, he had a bookkeeper, Louis Shumway. And what the government did with Shumway is they picked him up, took him out of this country and hit him in there in uh, Latin America uh, until the trial came about and then he showed up and testified. Capone was found guilty not of murder or racketeering but tax evasion. The punishment for transgression of the Mafia Code of Silence is death. So to obtain witnesses against the mob, the government must first guarantee their safety. 
This is accomplished by the Witness Protection Program, which offers the turncoat a new identity and protection by U.S. Marshals. With that offer, the federal government has wooed some improbable allies from the world of organized crime. One of those was Cleveland underboss Angelo Leonardo, whose testimony helped end the reign of New York's Mafia Commission. Leonardo is perhaps the single uh, most important organized crime uh, witness that the government has turned. He was in a position to know of the relationship between the Cleveland family and the Teamsters, which was extremely close. He was in a position, because he was an underboss in Cleveland, to know of the national structure of organized crime. Leonardo was also considered one of the mob's most loyal generals. But when he was convicted on a drug charge at the age of 74, Leonardo turned. And he laid out for the feds the nationwide network that ran the American Mafia. He showed how all the lines of power led back to New York. There, the heads of New York's five Mafia families sat on the commission, a Mafia board of directors. It had been set in place in the 1930s by New York mobster Lucky Luciano. And for five decades, it settled territory disputes, divvied up profits, and approved controversial executions. As Cleveland underboss Big Ange Leonardo had taken orders from the commission for years, he fingered Genovese boss Fat Tony Salerno, Colombo boss Carmine the Snake Persico, and Lucchese chief Tony Dux Corallo for supervising the Mafia's activity nationwide. The New York bosses may never have pulled a trigger or spent a dime of illegal cash, but from his high post in the Midwest, Leonardo said he could trace the chains of command to them. When he turned, he proved uh, for all who take the trouble to, to look uh, that the very structure that's designed to insulate the figures of organized crime from accountability can be turned against it. Because he was high up, he had both power and information. When the commission trial was over, the three bosses were convicted and sentenced to 100 years each. Paul Castellano of the Gambinos had been indicted, but he was murdered on John Gotti's orders before the trial began. Angelo Leonardo, thanks to the Witness Protection Program, was freed from prison and relocated. He also admitted to receiving more than a million dollars from the Justice Department. That kind of deal infuriates defense attorney Albert Krieger, who in defending John Gotti, faced mob rat Sammy Gravano on the stand. Krieger says the government has given itself the right to buy testimony. Well, you make the price high enough, and almost anybody is going to say anything in order to either reap a financial benefit, a liberty benefit, uh, or whatever the government happens to be selling at the time. Gotti prosecutor Patrick Cotter worked extensively with Gravano before he testified. He admits that some mob rats are a little too eager to please to show their new government bosses that they're worth the price. A lot of these guys, you get to a point where you have to tell them to just let me ask the questions, don't volunteer things, don't try to help me, just tell me what happened. One surprising critic of the deals made with mob rats is a mob rat himself, Joe Dogs Iannuzzi. They get a guy like Sammy the Bull that committed 19 murders and put him in your neighborhood to live and put John Gotti away, which is good to one point, but what did you gain? Sammy DeBull is going to commit more murders. He's going to get more trouble. He's a career criminal. The statistics show that those people who have been professional criminals by going through the witness protection program, it has a better rate of rehabilitation than any other uh, corrections program we know of. In fact, most of these people do not engage in criminal behavior in the future. But the marshals will kick a rat out of the witness protection program for less than committing a crime. And Joe Doggs ought to know. In 1993, he was invited to New York to appear on The Late Show with David Letterman. The Justice Department warned him not to make such a public move. Joe Doggs went anyway. But when he arrived at the studio, Letterman had canceled Iannuzzi's segment. I said that uh, Letterman thinks he's got a problem with that uh, lady sitting waiting for him when he walks in the house. <laughs> Well, he finds, uh, walks home one night and he, he sees me sitting there. The marshals dropped him from the witness protection program, but it's thanks to Joe Dogs and his fellow mob rats that the government has obtained convictions against most of the Mafia's leadership in the last 10 years.
The existence of the Mafia's bloody brotherhood is now commonly accepted as fact. But until the early 1960s, even the FBI didn't publicly acknowledge that there was a Mafia. That all changed in 1963, when one man broke the decades of murderous silence. The Mafia is a paradox for American justice. On the one hand, it sucks up millions of law enforcement dollars and man hours every year. But it's also an outfit whose very existence is denied by its members. Mob rats have been the key to exposing this clandestine society. Joseph Falacci stunned the world in 1963 when he was the first to uncover America's Cosa Nostra. What I'm telling you, what I'm exposing to you and the press and everybody, this is my doom. Before Falacci testified, uh, there were serious uh, sociologists, uh, people in the media that questioned the very existence of the mob. After Valachi's testimony in public, uh, it became an accepted fact that there was a mob structure. Valachi was a soldier in New York's Genovese crime family. Busted in 1959 on a narcotics charge, he ended up in federal prison in Atlanta, sharing a cell with his boss, Vito Genovese. But soon Valachi became convinced that Genovese thought he was an informer and wanted him dead. One day in the prison yard, Valachi made a preemptive strike. He saw a man approaching him that he was sure was going to be uh, his executioner. And at that point, he grabbed a pipe and uh, beat this guy to death. As he told me, after the first couple of swings, there was so much blood, you couldn't tell who the hell this guy was. It was, in fact, the wrong guy. Valachi had killed a man whom he had mistaken for a known mob assassin. Now he faced a possible death sentence for the prison yard murder. A year after the killing, the aging mob soldier turned to the authorities and offered them his story. Agents interviewed him for more than a year. Then in September 1963 came Valachi's public performance. He appeared before a Senate subcommittee led by Arkansas Democrat John McClellan. There he told the world what he had told the FBI, that there was a mafia complete with bosses, underbosses, and rituals of initiation, which Valachi was the first to describe. He picks your finger. Ooh, ooh, the Godfather. He had to hold a holy picture, burning holy picture, and repeat his oath of allegiance to Cousin Oster and promise never to reveal its secrets, um, even in the face of death. This is the way I'd burn if I exposed this organization. From his remarkable memory, Valachi pulled figures and dates for mob deals, battles, and executions. He mapped out entire family structures in New York and Buffalo. His information had a huge impact on both the underworld and the upper world. A few years after Valachi testified, the federal government legalized its triple threat against the mob. Wiretapping statutes to allow eavesdropping, the witness protection program to recruit informers, and the RICO anti-racketeering law. Naturally, the mob wanted Valachi dead, but they never got him. And although the federal government first suppressed a book based on the FBI's interviews, Peter Moss eventually published the Valachi papers from his own talks with the informer. Valachi died in prison in 1971. The one thing that made him happy was the fact that Vito Genovese died in prison too and died before him. The last message I got from Valachi that I can recall was, you see, Peter, I told you this book would kill the old man. Valachi and those who followed him have forever taken away the invisibility of the mafia. Their reasons may have been self-serving, but by exposing the mob's inner workings, the mob rats have made a unique contribution to American justice, and they have helped cripple the mob, perhaps permanently. The ethnic core of the Mafia, Italian-Americans only and others need not apply, reinforced the membership's pride and loyalty. In the wake of successful mob prosecutions, gangs built around other immigrant groups are moving onto the scene. These outfits, Asian, Hispanic, Jamaican, and others, have adopted the brutal methods of the Italian mob, but they have not shown the obsessive loyalty that kept the old Mafia intact for so long. Leaders of some new gangs are already behind bars, put there with the help of turncoats from their own ranks. In fact, with its glory days long over, the Mafia's last great legacy may be the enormous power of the federal government to strike back at organized crime.